pod sass by putting the sass back in sassy sponsored by leader pro where you can book demos with target customers on demand and fill your sales pipeline instantly Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Podsass. I'm your host, Chris Shang, and today we have Pushpa from Market Beam. How's it going, Pushpa? Doing very well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining us. And you're coming to us from the Bay Area? Yes, yeah, San Francisco Bay Area. Got it. Very cool. Um, and I and I know this only because you know we've worked together in the past, but also you both you and your husband are entrepreneurs, is that correct? And that is correct, yes. Very interesting. I have a lot of questions about that, but before we do that, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about what Market Beam is, what you guys do, and who makes a great customer for you guys? We're a fully SaaS company here. Uh, Market Beam is a social media publishing and application platform. These days, every company needs a layer on top of social media. So that is the social media management, and that's what we do, and then make it super simple for all employees to share it automatically or get a Slack message or email. That's as easy as it can get. We have proven ROI over and over um, for any high growth companies, starting from anywhere from like, you know, 25 employees, going all the way up to like thousands of uh, employees um, in a company. So we are industry agnostic, but marketing teams uh, from tech companies and health tech and financial services, these are all make a good SAP for us. Got it. Very cool. Um, so I have a lot of questions around that and ultimately how you ended up starting the business. But before we do so, we have a series of rapid fire questions where we get to understand Pushpa, the entrepreneur, as an individual, a little bit outside the scope of a founder. Um, but if you're up for it, we can jump right into it. All right, let's do it. Awesome. First question is pretty straightforward, but do you have a favorite entrepreneur and or startup story? And it can be one of the same or, or two different. Uh, it's always Steve Jobs. It's okay. always Steve Jobs. <laughs> the, the major uh, a thing that I see uh, that I haven't really like, you know, seen other entrepreneurs is how close he was to the product. Mm. That is amazing. I and mean, I don't hear that a lot. I do hear that a little bit with Musk, but not so much. So, like you know, that is that is very very critical. I'm the pro- I consider myself a product CEO because that means like you know very close to customers and product every day. Got it. Very cool. Um, and then the startup story. I love Netflix. Yeah. Netflix. They did so many pivots and not just only to survive but to be leaders in those. And then other companies followed them in every step that they went. From one step to another, starting from I still remember getting uh, DVDs in mail to now they're still leaders. That's a fantastic story. Yep, absolutely. I love that story too. Next question is, uh, back when you're like eight, nine, ten years old, do you remember what you wanted to be as a kid at that time? I <laughs> I wanted to be, I still remember, because I wanted to be an owner of a manufacturing factory. I don't know what I wanted. I really liked manufacturing, like the factories. And uh, I, I wanted to manage that. Interesting. Um, anything in particular you wanted to manufacture or was just kind of the idea of it? Just the idea of it. Just the Building. idea of it. Uh, I did, in my uh, career, I didn't really get anything close to that, but I just kind of like, you know, see and now with everything is like digital, but it's the same concept. Absolutely. Uh, it's still like this concept of building or creating, I feel like, and it carries all over. Yeah. Um, next question is, uh, this can be personal or professional, but the question is most painful experience. And I'll preface it with the fact that I think, um, you know, periods of our lives where we experience the most exponential growth tends to, tends to stem right after periods of extreme discomfort. And so has there been any kind of like inflection point in your life where obviously it was super difficult to kind of go through it at that time, but looking back was, you know, an, an impetus for kind of like where you ended up today or, uh, you know, a reflection point where, you know, you obviously took a lot of life learnings from. So that uh, happened in many steps in my uh, career life. So this one goes back to, because I actually changed my roles in companies and then changed the industry and then the types of companies that I work for, like every five to seven years. So every time I get into that, it's extremely discomfort and uh, discomfort. And also I appreciate that after the fact that, okay, I'm learning something. Otherwise I get bored too, right? So I'm like, no, I, I need to do something something different. For, for example, 
I started my career as actually I was coding. I was, mm. uh, I was an engineer. I was actually coding and then for several years and after that moved to more to product and there was a lot of different right so it's like the people that you work with so you are you're in your clinical working versus now you got to work with like people across the world and it's a very different world it's very discomforting and then also like you know travel that got added uh, all these things but i learned almost like you know every department in a company by doing that mm. so i just know how the roles are very cool um next question here is you know, obviously starting a business is very difficult. Um, is there anything in particular, you know, when in those stressful times that, that, you know, motivates you in the 25th hour kind of pushes you, you know, an intrinsic motivator perhaps, um, that keeps you going? So there are two, two things. One is the, the part of the building itself and then how we're helping. Right. So like that, that does definitely motivates me every day every day and then I want this to be perfect for our customers. And then the second part is the people that don't work, I will call them work with me, not that just work for me. So the people that work for Market Beam, they are we are a small lean team. And then yet each one of them is so dedicated to just what they do. And then that really keeps me motivated. Got it. And in these like stressful moments again, you know, of, of running a business, um, from building something from the ground up, what is it that you personally go to, to decompress? So like to that, like my husband is also a non runner So that's actually a, a good thing. And, uh, there are some not so good things about that too, that he also gets super busy, but at the same time, and you know, we, we tend to understand what or I mean, even to a very, very detailed minute level about like, you know, how, how to hire, how to like, you know, all these things. That's definitely helped me a lot. Um, one is to just decompress and then also to see what's out there and then learn from each other. Fair enough. Um, and, and this next question is, you know, you tend to wear a lot of different hats as an entrepreneur. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously you working with your, um, your husband also being an entrepreneur. I mean, I think there's a lot to be learned, you know, collectively, but has there been a skill that you've picked up along the way that you've loved or hated, you know, knowing that you've worn a lot of hats? Yeah, sales was not my forte. Okay. <laughs> so when I picked that up a lot, uh, of course with Market Beam, and then before that, I mean, to be with belief in product, I not sold the product, right? So I was pretty close to selling, in a team and then, you know, being a product manager, we always sold. And, uh, I was always then like, you know, very close to customers. And then my thing is always like, you know, you should have your customers on your speed dial that I always did in every job that I had. Mm. And I love working with customers and, but I would, I had not completely like, you know, close to deal all by myself. And then that's something that I have to do every day. And then even today as Mark being got it. Next question is uh, two parts. So one, do you have a bucket list? And then two, what's one of the more ambitious items on that bucket list? Ooh, so is that like professional, personal, anything? Either or, yeah. I mean, you know, I think a lot of times now, especially, right, like personal and professional is somewhat intertwined and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm, you know, I think a lot of each pushes the other in a lot of shapes and forms, but it could be either or. So, you know, you know, kind of like the legacy, my ideal legacy that I want to be is there is still, unfortunately, if you search the internet, like how many women entrepreneurs are out there and then who actually like build the company and then also run of the company. There are many examples of women CEOs who are running the company. That's a really good thing to see. And also there are some founders, but they don't run the company. So we definitely think, like, oh, that's like, a, that's the sweet spot for any successful, especially be, me being here in San Francisco, Bay, yeah, that's the successful path. And then somebody that can build and then also around the company. So my, my bucket list, one of the things that are top things is if somebody searches on the internet, how many women entrepreneurs are out of there? If I can add one more number to it, I would be happy. Fair enough. And that ultimately alludes to the last question that we had. Um, but it's the idea of, you know, what kind of legacy or impact you wanted to leave on the earth before you leave it. But I think you kind of answered it right there. So 
um, we are, I'm happy to kind of just jump into you know, the next series of questions where you're know, separating from the, the rapid fire questions, but just to get to know your journey a little bit more and dive into what that looks like. Um, I know you, you, you mentioned that you um, jumped around in different types of fields uh, as it relates to your, your corporate experience. So can you walk us through a little bit of what that looked like? I know you started off as an engineer, ended up going into product, worked at B of A, you know, companies like Oracle, et cetera, uh, before you ended up starting Market Beam. So um, yeah, before we get to that to that journey of like you getting um, to finding or discovering the idea for Market Beam, what was kind of like that journey like for you? And was entrepreneurship always on the radar? To, uh, to be honest, entrepreneurship was not on the radar for me. And then mostly, again, like, you know, going back to my passion about like building products and then being close to customers and then make really like you know a, a successful products and then something that you know that my, my always my goal was like you know if every of my customers spends five minutes on a product that i built every day i'm successful already because we are drowning in product today right so the tool and there are about 17,000 SaaS companies just alone in the us right so mm-hmm. there are so many tools out there if we can do that, then I will, will be successful. So going back to that is again, like when I was working, um, I was uh, I was developing products from the beginning, but knowing more about the audience of the product, what their pain points, and then that's how my journey completely like go 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 from coding to be product management into a part of um, marketing. And then that kind of like, you know, fell into my lap when my boss left. So like, you know, the marketing fell into my lap. That was the really good thing that happened. And uh, also kind of like, you know, working very close to sales and then being a CEO. So I see that as a very logical way of somebody actually like growing into learning everything about a company and then becoming an entrepreneur. Got it. So it was maybe somewhat of like that fortuitous experience, I suppose, of your boss leaving and then you jumping into that more of that leadership role, getting that more exposure that then led you to maybe having that visibility of, oh, okay, I could probably do this on my own. Absolutely. And then I worked for startups too, right? So I worked for cybersecurity startups where I, I saw the the founders and the CEO really, really closely and then how they were successful and then how they built it. And then they can all take, oh, I have experience in all these pieces and then also a very natural problem that we were solving internally turned into market beam today. Got it. So being a marketer, it's like getting the brand out there, like some social media was a tactic to begin with, even like, you know, five or six years ago, even like four or five years ago, there wasn't much of an awareness in all of the industries. Now every industry has a strategy behind how their social media it should be that is the biggest marketing channel for sure and so was it in one of those experiences with one of those startups where ultimately you realize that big hurdle of, of generating awareness was a bottleneck or ultimately you know i guess a, a a pain point that was worth solving for and was that the the start or the origination for the idea of market beam absolutely so we were at like i was working for a pretty popular brand okay. and the brand's name the value itself was helpful but yet everybody was kind of like you know starting I mean, when you put a social media strategy together it was a struggle whether it were a big company small old mm-hmm. everybody had to go through that and then so i was uh, like a, like and like you know got into marketing because my boss left so because we got acquired and then a lot of things changed and then uh, a biggest responsibility there was to get the product out and again, like, you know, market it. And social media was something that was lacking and then we mm-hmm. learned a lot about it. And uh, so like, can we, this can be solved with a tool and we'll have to do it manually. Got it. Now from going through that experience, having the ideation for market being from having this domain expertise around the existing pain point as the end user, um, how long from there to then like formally starting Market Beam where like you incorporate a business, you know, you decide to leave and you start working on product? Yeah, I started thinking about this one. And then the first thing that did is like, you know, like we we can get started without actually like, you know, just an MVP without mm-hmm. making it uh, like a, a big investment into it. And literally 
I hired a few people and outs outsourced that work and then we got the MVP and then perhaps like, you know, asked around and then my own network, hey, would you use this product? And just three beta customers to begin with. And that's how I usually get started, like, you know, your own network. And they were all pretty sick. I said, like, you know, don't give me any money, just like, you know, use the product and they tell me how it goes. And they were successful. They were all high growth startups themselves. So they saw success and they're like, okay, and we use it every day. I mean, okay, now I think it has legs and now we mm. can make, you know, spend more on it. And then that's when I decided, okay, let me uh, focus on this full time and I can definitely make, you know, make this happen. My background in tech is definitely, definitely a plus And then it helps a lot in building this thing, even though it's like, you know, outsourced. For all the entrepreneurs that are out there thinking about it, it's definitely not very hard to get somebody to like build it. But if you can get your hands dirty a little bit, it can be very, very efficient. For and sure. Um, Got it. So walk us through that, because I think this is the most interesting part of like the, the founder journey or the entrepreneurial journey. Everybody's is a little bit different, but when they make that leap to doing it full time, right? Um, you know, some... Are, are, are starting off and it's from idea to product, it's all a big risk. <laughs> and then there's others that are more calculated with their time and their resources. And it seems like you're more on the, in the latter side. So um, can you walk us through just like the timing of it all? Like you had this idea, you decide to go, you know, so outsource engineers, build the product, you're spending time, you're off time perhaps, um, you know, to, to wireframe, build up the product, research it spending time on design, et cetera. Uh, how long to build an MVP? And I guess like just walk us through, yeah, the, the process of like, how did you outsource the team? Um, you know, yeah. how did you, you know, how long did it take to for you to get it to MVP? How long to get to validation? And then, you know, from beginning to end, what was that time period look like where, you know, ultimately you made that decision to, to go in full time? Because I think that's like, there's a lot of, I think, um, people who work in tech that think they have the legs for it, but the way that you did it was very smart, right? And it didn't feel like it was like this big risk that some non-technical founders feel like that they're taking this big, bigger leap, I feel like sometimes. Um, but yeah, walk us through what that might've looked like. Cause I think that's that's something somebody can learn from. Yeah, so it's like you kind of brought up with two sets of people. One as with tech background, and they are still thinking about whether to like, you know, fully dedicate their time to a startup. And the other, one, other set of people is they do not have the tech background themselves, but they do have the idea of the problem and they, how they can solve it. So I can address both of these things. So for people that do have tech background and they can build it, so first of all, make sure that the problem and the solution is something that you really want to solve. You really want to solve that is very very critical and then also kind of like you know take baby steps if you're personally not able to like make it a full-time job take a baby steps and then I, I i will let you know how i i, I did that and then for those other set of people who have who do not have tech background there are some investors that are out there these days they're also like providing probably like you know chris you can say some examples here is they are also like providing some tech help in terms of like, you know, like design side and then also like building it and then they have their own networks and they kind of like, you know, talk to them about it, whether they invest in your idea or not, they do have that network. And then also like, you know, have your own networks and then outsourcing, uh, I'm, I'm a, a foreign born, uh, but yet it is really hard to have networks outside of the country to make that really like, you know, efficient that it's multi and actually make that hiring. Just this is again through like you know networks, and uh, I'll be definitely like you know, I'm just like announcing it here, but I would be happy to talk to anybody that's out there because which I have done in the past. How do you hire um, people that are outside of the country? So I've talked, I've, I've actually advised a couple of startups already just to understand the culture and then how to hire. That's one thing that's very very important. So once I heard that um, to your question, it took took me about three months to build an MVP before we mm -hmm. go to beta, we, before we went to beta. And then beta about like three months of solid, just like, you know, 
asking for feedback and bucks and pizzas and then you know all those things and then the time came when somebody was ready to give me a check mm. and that's when i thought okay you know what i gotta make this full time so that was a trigger point and then also i was getting so so excited about the feedback and then people were like okay in the middle of the day like okay i have something that i need to solve can you solve it it's like i have a job it's like no okay this is that was a really a trigger point for me sure. both the check and then also like you know just the passion for it so that took some time and then after that like you know our fourth customer literally fourth customer uh started paying um and uh, after that it just more of uh scaling got it got it um and so how long ago was was that in terms of making that decision go full time? And then how has kind of like your go to market and, you know, growth been um, since that point in time? Learnings, you know, uh, exercises, successes, wins, losses, et cetera. So there was a lot of learning, a lot of learning because again, like, you know, I had to get my hands dirty and like every, every role and then including uh, I don't know if you know that for including accounting and then which I hated when I was in business school. <laughs> but now I, I do even like you know look at accounting very, very closely. Um so just to, to just in the, the the learning as in again, Rick, you know, a lot of these things were outsourced, um, and then seeing trial and error and then what are things on it. That's how all companies learn. But at the same time, how quickly you can make those changes. And then that is very, very important. It's actually like, you know, something everybody talks about, but when you want to really make that change, it's not easy. It's not that easy, right? So you'll hire someone and you see that, okay, they are not at the same pace and then it's really hard to let them go or like, you know, even contracting or anything. You do need to make that change, not, to, it's for the business, right? So those are very, very hard ones to make. The, positions and then you should be really, really fast in making that. Otherwise, uh, we would we'll be losing a lot of time. Got it. And talk to me a little bit about like, you know, I think you're in a unique situation where definitely um, in a smaller percentage of our other guests, but you have a partner that's also an entrepreneur, um, also in the tech startup scene in, in the world and, and as a founder. And um, walk me through, I think, I guess, like some of the pros and cons of having that. You guys, obviously, it's have you know it's a great sounding board, uh, you know I can, I can imagine a lot of pros, but then also similarly right like, you guys are both probably under immense amounts of pressure at the same time, um, you know so that that's perhaps one of the cons I don't know but um, can you speak to can you speak to that and and how have you guys uh, found a way to, you know obviously the professional uh, benefits but also then you know personally making the time for for one another and finding the value in, in that time. Yeah, that, that is definitely not uh, easy unless like you make it work, right? So one of the things that I would say is uh, for every entrepreneur that are out there, if people around you who are like friends or family, they need to know your journey and that they need to understand and then walk with you, be able to like walk with you. Otherwise, it becomes really, really hard. And that way we're going to like, you know, either like lose that or lose your, like, you know, without the purpose that we're doing so it, sometimes they cannot coexist if they do not understand it i think there are many professions out there that it's very similar but i think we can you know we have a tech startup well you know it i know it it's it's really like you know we put in a lot of effort um so just with the us uh being a couple and then also both of us being very very busy um we do make it a point that we do spend some time again like kind of like with dinners and all those things and at the same time we kind of like you know are able to tell okay this is the time that you cannot make it to dinner and then i fully understand so that is the good part about it and then of course like you know a lot of just the time of being more organized uh i have like like you know like personally i'm not a really organized person and many many it comes to like calendars and everything i put a really hard thing for me to learn um and then put that midri on the calendar of the organized for all these days that you can spend some time with each other, but, um, and then also, you know, if everything is like, okay, today you have a bad day. All right. You have someone to talk to at the mm -hmm. end of the day. And then, you know, if that person can understand what you are exactly going through, that just makes it a little bit easier. For sure. Yeah. 
I mean, I think it's, uh, it's, it's definitely something that's not talked about as much, but I think it's super important, you know, your support system as a, as a founder, as an entrepreneur, as an executive, a lot of the times, you know, if you don't have that personal support system at home or through friends or through family, it can make, you can make it very, very difficult, right? Um, let alone almost impossible to, you know, be, be good at what you need to do every day, day in and day out. And then the other thing too, is like, you know, like, oh, well, I like fully bootstrapped. Um, yeah. My Khabib is fully bootstrapped. And uh, my partner says like, you know, always with make a very good investment. And then there's always, again, like pros and cons between these two as well. There's yeah. pressure that comes from um, institutional money. And then there's pressure that comes from bootstrapping both. It's very different. Um, that puts very different kinds of stresses. Yeah. You want to speak to that a little bit? Because, you know, I, I, I you know, I've been in both situations and I, I can understand the pressures of, of both and the unique values of both as well. So, um, but is there anything that you guys have talked about where, you know, maybe he's like, I wish I was, I didn't take those institutional <laughs> checks or vice versa, where you're like, I wish I had some institutional checks or, you know, what, what have you, but, um, what are what have been some of the benefits of being bootstrapped versus uh, you know, your husband's situation and, and then vice versa? Yeah, so exactly what you said. Like we were talking about it several times. Like, oh, I wish I did have like, you know, somebody to like push me is what uh, I hear from him. And then like, you know, like, okay, so I wish I, I had uh, that support system as a board. So uh, bootstrap was my choice. And then I wanted to get like, you know, prove this out. And then we might be able to like, you know, when we might be ready for institutional money at some point, but at so far, we, we were able to um, get that revenue and then self fund our operations in a very, again, like, you know, pretty quickly. So that kept us going on um, this far. And that that's the one again, like, you know, bootstrapping is, uh, it, to get to all the entrepreneurs that are out there, bootstrapping is not easy, but at the same time, you can just like, you know, go at your own pace and, and then also go in the direction that you want to go and then kind of like, you know, be pretty independent about it. At the same time, uh, the revenues that we have with the bootstrapping and we are able to like impress people with that. Um, and, but again, like, you know, it's a very, very different journey. Well, what has been your experience, Chris? Um, I mean, it was, it. I see the pros and cons of both, right? I think like for me, with what we were building out, um, I always wanted to try to get to cash flow positive as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, that was just my goal to try to do it in less than six months from when we launched. And so we were fortunately able to do so. And I think... It was always that first, as opposed to trying to raise any capital. And um, I have a mentor. His name's Joshua Lee, and he's he's exited three companies, and he's exited a billion dollar company, and he's his latest exit was to to Gusto, uh, where he sold his um, accounting uh, tax solution called Ardius, and uh, he was the only signature required for the acquisition, and you know probably own more than 50 some percent, obviously, uh, equity in, 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 in that deal. And that was his most lucrative deal. So I think you know, it, was, it was interesting because before I went to go raise anything, I, I talked to him about it and he asked me what I wanted out of, uh, out of a raise or just what was the, my end goal for my startup. And, you know, my initial reaction, knee jerk reaction was to be like, I want to be a publicly traded company. And he asked me why. And and I said, well, you know, I feel like that's going to be the byproduct of success. And so he said, well, so if I offered you a fifty dollar million, fifty million dollar check today to buy your business, you wouldn't, you wouldn't consider it, you wouldn't take it because that's your goal. And I said, well, no, hold on a second. That's <laughs> probably, you know, that's that's life changing money, right? So like, it's ultimately a big decision. Um, but it forced me to really think about the fundraising process because I don't think a lot of founders tend to do that, like. When he exited that billion dollar exit, the, the, that billion dollar company, that billion dollar exit, but um, he had less than one percent ownership of the company at that point in time. He was a he was a founder and uh, of the, a co-founder of that business, and so <clears throat> I think there's a lot to be said. It took him 14 years to get that first exit. It took him a year and a half to get to that last one, and the last one was the most lucrative. So it depends on what you really want. You know, what are you trying to do and what are you trying to accomplish? What's the outcome that you're looking for? And, and that's how I went into our raise was thinking of it in that way. And so 
you know, I think um, I didn't want to do, like, dilute our our equity pool more than like 10, 12% ultimately. And so I raised significantly lower than what we possibly could have. Um, and that was intentional. But I think it was that was for me then the balance between like, this is going to get us an, the enough capital to really like hyper growth what we need to do based on what we know um, and get us to a next major milestone, which is possibly a setup for an acquisition or ultimately if we want to raise and at that point that we get to a favorable valuation enough where we feel comfortable in taking that outside capital again. So I don't know. I mean, that was my personal experience with it. And I don't know how you, know, you guys have spoken about it again. Like, I don't know your husband's situation with it either, but that was the, the personal mindset that I had going into it. Yeah. So it's important you know, when we can, uh, I mean, companies can be very efficient and then learn uh, if they're bootstrapped yeah. and then go raise. So that means everybody's kind of like, you know, to, to your point about like, you know, how much equity you're ready to get, right? So that can be at least like, you know, the first round or the second round, you can get a really good advantage if you're already like, you know, cash flow positive and you are ready to raise. And that is actually like, you know, a really good thing that can happen to any company. And then you can still um, retain your ownership. Yeah. I mean, is that kind of the thinking for, for Market Beam at this point is kind of build it and grow yeah. as, as far as you possibly can take it independently as a bootstrap business? And at that point, you know, having an option of taking institutional funding. Yeah, so that's exactly what uh, I'm currently thinking about. So there is another, the future of social media is something, I mean, especially for companies, is something that I think about every day. So where, mm. when is this going, right? So is this like, you know, making people's lives just easier as like, you know, marketing people and it's like a tool or something, there is something more to it. Where is this industry going? So the thing that comes to my mind and then uh, I'm working towards that too is the companies that are in the regulated industries and they have a lot of compliance that's on top of social media. And then that is going to be, I mean, today that's only regulated industries like life sciences and financial services and government, but it is going to be part of every industry. If not like tomorrow, it is going to be in like for 10 years, every company would be like looking at that. So all industries, what you get, like you have seen industries for hundreds of years, and then there would, there would be a time where the companies go beyond a certain point and then the government has to step in and then talk about like, okay, compliance and then being fairly played fairly. So that has happened by the industries and then social media is on the same realm at this point. So now what we see more of is from the consumer perspective, what we're seeing and then everything that we see, but from the company's perspective and then how they can um, put out fires or like something happens to the brand or the brand realm and all those things and then how they can educate the mm -hmm. audience because there's a high there's a huge responsibility on these companies to inform their own audience very accurately, know this information, and then so that they are they consume it. So that's where my thinking goes is we need to enable these companies to make sure that they are compliant and they are telling like and like you know their audience the right thing. So for that we're actually working on some AI uh, in the background. And then that might require more investment to your, it's a long answer to your question, but that's where I think I see, you know, we may need investment if we need to. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. To expand the breadth of the, expand the breadth of the product. And then uh, AI is the key, right? So this year, that's pretty like, you know, without the AI, it's like, you know, products are not smart. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. I, I mean, why do I mean, I'm curious as to how you're, I mean, I know we are, we are looking in terms of like, you know, how to leverage AI. And, you know, I, I think last year it was all about, you know, Web3 and the metaverse. And, you know, it was almost this dystopian future. Uh, and then chat GPT launched <laughs> upon us and it was like game changing. AI was something we we're talking about, you know, five, six years ago. And now it's here. Right. And now yep. it's 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 this. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's commercial. Like, I mean, I was playing around with it with my fiance, writing songs and writing, creating, creating mm -hmm. stories and po like it is, it's pretty, 
you know, impressive. And so um, obviously it, it hit the tech world very quickly, very rapidly, but I think the consumer level is like, it's just right around the corner. It's so easy to adopt. Uh, but what, what are, how is that, um, you know, it's still early in the year, but like, how has the, this new uh, revelation kind of, you know, changed or, you know, maybe further expedited some of the thinking around AI for, for your company as well as your product? So we are actually like, even like getting asked by like there some of our, our, our other customers that we talk to because chat GPT, one of the first things that comes to people's mind is writing content. Yep. And then writing content is right up our alley and then it comes writing content and then we are the ones to publish and then mentor mm -hmm. the ROI of the content that they're writing. And then the things that we do is uh, like, again, like, you know, we understand trying to understand, okay, why this post was popular. Among all the posts that you did this month, that is one thing that we, we try to understand. Is it the character limit? Is this the number of characters, hashtag, the image, or is it the video, or is it the text that people that did? Like, what is it that we try to understand? And then chat GPT is all about like, you know, writing content. And then the way that our customers started asking us is like, do you have an integration with ChatGPT? Okay, so what do you need that to write social media posts? And then we did an experiment internally and then we asked ChatGPT about like, why didn't we have to post on LinkedIn? And if you go to my LinkedIn, probably it's a couple of weeks ago, and then then is one of my posts and that was completely generated by ChatGPT. And then we did that as an experiment and we got a really good engagement on it. It's like people couldn't really like tell that it was me or it was chat to be. So mm. we, we're doing our own experiments and I think it's going to be like, you know, again, a write up rally because it's all about like writing content. Interesting. And last question here, as we're kind of like rounding up on the hour would be, you know, where, what are you super excited about um, in terms of like seeing the, the immediate future here in the next, you know, few years for, for market beam in terms of, where do you where do you see yourself going and and where do you see this potential of market being ultimately in the next couple of years? So um so social media again, like management and publishing has become a need for every company in the world. And then today it is a twelve plus billion dollar business, and then it is actually expected to grow up to like twenty one billion throughout the world in uh, end of this um uh, decade. So with that, there would be more and more um, industry-specific problems that we need to solve. That's exactly what I'm uh, looking at at this point, is what does life sciences really need to be successful in social media? What does um, financial services industry need to be successful? And then a lot of those things uh, ties that back to my background, which is cybersecurity, and then understanding compliance. and merging compliance and then social social plus compliance is where it's see Barker being going. Awesome. On that note, thank you so much for joining us. It was really interesting to hear your journey in terms of how you ended up from engineer to product and product to marketing and then ultimately starting Market Beam. And uh, I think it was a very strategic, if not thoughtful journey um, that's a little bit different than I think uh, some of the chaotic ways that other founders have gotten to where they get to. Um, but I wish you nothing but, you know, but success. And, and I can see a tremendous amount of value in the product and the offering, um, you know, and a lot of companies obviously finding value in it as well. Thank you so much for having me. And it was a really good chat. Of course. About same. their companies and their backgrounds and everything. <laughs> good luck to you too. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much.